All right. Amen. Well, uh, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter number 7, and last week we started a brand new series titled Apology Theology. And if you remember, uh, the bottom line was the humble apologize and the proud jeopardize. Okay? And we talked about what that means and how people that are too proud to offer an apology when they've wronged somebody, you know, they jeopardize relationships, they jeopardize jobs, they jeopardize everything. It's definitely a path that we don't want to go down. And we talked about the three points or the three things we should remember when we are making apologies, which was number one, to express regret, to actually say we're sorry, but not just say, oh, sorry, right? We talked about what are you sorry for, right? Actually calling out what we did wrong and acknowledging that because that takes ownership. Then we talked about um, the second point, which was accepting uh, responsibility and offering some sort of restitution. Okay, like how can I make this right? We talked about how businesses will do this. Good businesses will do this, right? They'll, you know, when they mess up your order at a restaurant or something, a lot of times they'll say, hey, you know, we're, you know, thanks for your patience. What can we do to make this right? And we talked about, you know, if these guys can do that, if a business can do that, well, obviously God's people should be able to do that. You know, we should be able to offer some sort of solution or restitution. And then we talked about number three, actually asking for forgiveness. And it's a very simple thing, but it's hard to do. And we all know that because we've all been in the situation where we need to ask for that. And it's an often overlooked thing in regards to making a true apology. Okay. And what happens when we don't ask for forgiveness in some capacity? Well, we're insinuating that we don't really need to. Okay, the just the simple acknowledgement should just be taken, and that's what it is. And hopefully, last week you saw how important that was to actually maintaining relationships. You know, a lot of times people hold on to grudges simply because one of those three things is missing in some sort of apology. And when you make it right and you follow that advice, right? And where do we get that from? We got that from the prodigal son. Okay, and when we follow that wisdom, we make things better. So remember those things as we go through today. So look at verse number eight. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter number seven. Look at verse eight. Paul says this, he says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. The title of the sermon this morning is Sorry Not Sorry. Okay. And so the idea today is to bring some balance to what we talked about last week. Obviously, we want to be a people that make apologies when we are required to do so, when it's to make the situation right. Okay. But we also don't want to take it so far that we're apologizing for everything. Okay. That we're just a, a kind of a super humble, mega righteous type person, which doesn't exist, you know, or just, oh, sorry, sorry for everything. Just making apologies for everything. Okay. Because that can actually ruin you. And I will show you that. So we're going to take this verse apart here in a little while. Um, but I just wanted to bring a couple of things up. So the title is sorry, not sorry. So what does that mean? Well, it's an expression used to basically insinuate your lack of regret. Okay. And there are some things that our church is not sorry for. Okay, there are some things that we say and that we do. There are some uh, ways that we live by, which obviously come from the Word of God, that we are not sorry for. You know, and everybody in here has been in the situation before when you make somebody upset or they get offended. You know, that old man can want to tempt you to somehow come up with an apology, and you have to learn how to resist that. Otherwise, you're going to become this type of person that's just too nice. And people that are too nice never get anything done, okay, because you're off balance, like so many other things that we talk about in life. Now, Yesterday, we were out soul winning, and I, I picked this habit up. I think it, I forgot who it was from. It doesn't really matter, okay? But I'll just tell you, this is why you don't tell your wife what you're going to preach, because then they audit you for the entire week to see <laughs> what, if you're going to actually follow it. But, so yesterday we were out soul winning, and, and we were inside this enclosed apartment, okay? And the ladies were knocking, and, and Jessica heard me say something every time I would, you know, knock on someone's door and I would say, hey, you know, sorry for bothering you. You know, it's something that we just kind of picked up from someone else and that's supposed to soften the blow. And I don't know, it feels like it's kind of worked a little bit here and there. And it's just become part of my vocabulary. But she kind of brought that to my attention. I started thinking about it. And I started going over my notes and all the stuff that I'm going to, you know, preach this morning. And I'm like, you know what, you're right. You know, we need to stop doing that. So me personally, I'm going to stop saying that because I'm not sorry that I knocked on your door and then I want to give you the gospel. If you're offended, then go to hell. Okay. I mean, seriously. 
I mean, that, that's where we're at right now. Because look, this world has turned for the worse. And the people out there that want to become unreasonable and extremely hostile towards us, forget them. You know, if that's where you want to go, then go there. Okay. And you, you want to get super upset because our church knocked on your door, then good. I'm not sorry, though I did repent, like Paul said. So, you know, that's just the, a way that I've seen this affect me. Okay. And I'm going to show you how, you know, subconsciously when we do this, it does make us weak. It affects something that we're going to learn about here in a moment. Now, I want to give you the boiling point today. Okay. What this sermon is centered around, and it's really this question. Okay, and this is something you have to remember, and I want you to make part of your life. Every time that you feel that urge to compromise, to apologize, to say you're sorry for something, you need to ask yourself this question, which is, what does an apology require of me? What does an apology require of me? You say, well, why should I ask that? Well, what did we talk about last week? What is an apology? When do we owe an apology? Well, when we've wronged somebody, when we incur that debt, right? When we have done something wrong, when we have transgressed someone else in a relationship by our actions or by our words. I mean, we've all heard this, right? You owe that person an apology or you owe me an apology or I owe you, right? It's a debt. That's what it is. So what is the answer to what does an apology require of me? Well, the answer is obviously to heal a wrong that we did. But let me ask you a question. Is preaching the truth wrong? No. Is acting on the truth wrong? No. Are following the precepts laid out in the Bible wrong? Is being part of a fundamental Baptist church in an unfundamental world wrong? No. So should we make apologies when we offend our family, when we offend our so-called friends, our neighbors, or our coworkers? Yeah, and you know the answer. The answer is absolutely no. So what does an apology require of me? Okay. If you can remember that question and remember why we need to apologize to people to begin with, it's going to set you up for success and it's going to help us all get past this urge that we often feel to, to, to want to apologize for things, you know? We should never apologize. Oh, you know, I'm sorry that you're offended. Okay. I'm sorry that I go to church on Sundays offend you. I'm sorry that I can't hang out with you and go fishing on Wednesdays because I go to church or whatever it is. Okay. No, we, we, we don't say I'm sorry. It's like, Hey, thanks for your understanding. You know, <laughs> Hey, thanks for your understanding. Even though they don't, we make no apologies for doing what's right. Okay. And we have to understand that you think, well, this is a, a pretty basic subject, but it's not. Right? This is something that you and I actually have to put into practice. We have to audit our own selves, our own lives, look to our own ways and say, hey, you know, does this apply to me? Is this something that I am doing that I am guilty of? So with that being said, let's move on here. Let's look down at verse number eight again. I want to show you a connection here to what Paul's saying in verse number eight. So he says, for though I made you sorry with a letter. And look, we've talked about the Corinthians a lot. You know, they were up to some extremely wicked things, right? We talked about this last week, pride, arrogancy. They had somebody in their congregation that had committed fornication that hadn't even been named among Gentiles. So they're acting worse than people who don't even believe. Okay. And Paul just tears them to shreds. He says, look, what did, he, what did we learn on Wednesday? What did he tell the Corinthians? Hey, those who are saying that I'm weak in chapter 13, he's like, I'm not going to spare those people when I come. Okay. But look what he says, for though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. What does repent mean? Does it mean, oh, turn from your sins? No, it means to change. Okay. It means to change your mind, change your direction. And that is what it means. If I'm going to Albertsons over here to get a five gallon jug of water and realize that it's cheaper at Fred Meyer, well, I'm going to repent and go to Fred Meyer because it's cheaper. Okay. But enough on that. You understand what that means? I do not repent, though I did repent. So what does this mean here? Because it can be kind of confusing if you've never read this or had this broken down. Paul's just basically letting them know his struggle. Hey, I'm human too, right? It hurts when we have to tell people that we love the truth. It hurts when we have to rebuke people. It hurts when we have to stand up and somebody else wants to stand down. Somebody that we care about. It hurts. And that's what he's saying. So he's saying, hey, internally, I, I, I kind of felt like, oh, you know, should I have really gone down that far? Should I have really hammered, you know, that, that, that point home? But then he says this, For I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but 
for a season. Now, if you would, back up to verse number four, because I want to show you what actually led to Paul's follow through. So what is it that makes us bold? What is it that gives us that ability to not compromise, though someone's given us that puppy dog face or, you know, your, your friend of a long time, your family members, you know, and they're just really like they, they've got your heartstrings. Okay, they're in you, that you like they just they just have a way to make you feel like you're doing something wrong and you need to apologize to them. What separates somebody who caves versus somebody who just, you know what, I'm going to keep on going like Paul did? Because Paul's honest, right? He admits, hey, though I did repent for a season, it, this vexed me for a little while. This, this is hard to do, right? He wants people to just get saved, live for the Lord like we all do. He doesn't want to have to be hammering people down all the time, but he absolutely had to do that. And I want to show you what the answer is to those questions. Look at verse number four. So Paul says this, great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. And so what I want you to understand there is that Paul's, you know, doing what Paul does. Paul was a very bold individual. Paul was a very aggressive individual when it comes to the truth, right? I mean, you got to ask yourself, you know, with Paul's background, okay, being a Pharisee, putting Christians to death, consenting to their death. He was there when Stephen was stoned, okay? How did he become the main figure in the New Testament? Well, I truly believe it was his ability to be bold under extremely high pressure situations, situations that are surrounded by a lot of emotion. Okay. And look, anybody who wants to ever go into the ministry, you have to learn from this. You have to be like this. You have to be able to tell people hard truths, no matter how you feel about those people. Look, every mother, every father, every, every sibling, really, honestly, every person in here, if you want to be successful in those relationships, if you want to be successful at edifying people, you have got to understand this. You have got to understand that your boldness is connected to how apologetic you are, okay? I'm telling you right now, look, I'll tell you a story. When I was in Japan, you know, one of the things that they would tell us is like, these people are super apologetic. Like they will always say sorry. Like, you know, if they're looking at you and you're kind of like freaked out, they'll, they'll say sorry in Japanese, you know? Um, but, but the one thing they won't say sorry for is literally shoulder checking you or bumping into you. It, it's, a, it's hilarious. You know, like people walk by and just, mm, just give you a good one. And it's like, dude, and they would brief us like, hey, you cannot react like you would back in America. OK, because they don't mean anything by it. They're in tight quarters. Right. Who's ever just seen pictures of Japan? You know, who's ever seen pictures of Tokyo with millions of people around? OK, who's ever seen the pictures of them cramming people onto these subway trains with like a broom looking device? That's a literal thing. So they're used to, to being, you know, in tight quarters with each other and so when they bump people they just oh it's it's not a thing they, they're not going to say oh sorry right but but they'll say sorry for everything else and here's one thing that i've noticed they are not a bold people i'm not being racist at all look i'm just being honest they are not a bold people i used to train at this mixed martial arts gym there it was called rodeo style and one of the guys that did speak english there he would say you know why we don't have he said one of the reasons why we don't have like a major champion why we don't dominate the MMA circuit is because we're too nice. We are brought up to never fight each other. He's like, so he's like, I've never been in a real fight. I've never had any real controversy. You know, as soon as beef starts up there, people just solve it real quick. And, and you say, well, that's a good thing. It is and it isn't. Okay, because there are some times where you need to stand up to people and tell them that they're jacked up. Tell them that they're ate up. We need to have boldness, okay? And honestly, this is one of the things about our culture that used to bug them. But it's something in our culture that's going away, okay? And you have to understand that. We talk about that all the time. You know, the, 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 the world's course, if you will, being ran by the devil, is trying to drive every godly attribute from society that is possible. So going back to this verse here, let's look at it one more time. So it says, great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. So we need to understand that our boldness and being over apologetic, they are connected. Okay, so Paul saying in verse number eight, when you skip to verse eight, he's like, look, I don't repent though I did repent. 
Okay, he's like, hey, look, I have this internal struggle. I want to I wanna comfort you, but at the same time, I know that the discipline is more important. That's what's going to get results. So here's really the first thing that I want to mention this morning is apologizing when not necessary can have negative effects on your confidence. Okay, And as a Bible-believing Christian, I'm going to tell you this right now, and you already know it. You absolutely have to have confidence. You have to have boldness. You have to be able to stand up to people. Look, you don't even really have to say anything, and people that just come around you will automatically be offended. You know, all it takes is, hey, what are you doing tonight? And it's Wednesday, and it's at work, or you're at the store, and you're in the grocery line. Okay, oh, I'm going to church. That there, a lot of times, just that statement in 2022, February 6th, can offend a lot of people. It's so weird. It's so bizarre. But that's the world that we're living in. Okay, go to Proverbs chapter number 28. Proverbs chapter number 28. Do you really honestly think that if Paul was a over apologetic type person, always trying to, you know, make amends for any kind of conflict that God would have chose him, that God would have used him? I think you know the answer to that. So what's the solution here? How do we get God to use us better? Because we want to be able to reach more people in this community. We want to be able to stand up for fundamentalism, right? Which is really just believing the Bible as it's written. Okay, that's all we're trying to promote here. We're trying to contend. We're trying to battle with all these other philosophies that are going on out here, which are pulling people away from the written word of God. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do that by understanding that we need to be bold. We, we're going to do that by understanding that, you know, if we're not a confident people, God's not going to use us. Think about that. If you are not confident, if you don't have boldness, you will be out of this church. I'm not going to kick you out, right? That's not a kickable, <laughs> a kick outable offense. Okay. But when Wednesday comes, when Sunday comes, when soul winning comes, when prayer comes, which is every day, when Bible reading comes, which is every single day, and someone else that's competing for your attention is there and you can't tell them no, then guess what? You are going to compromise and God's not going to use that. Okay. Hopefully everybody in here understands that. This is very important. Proverbs 28, look at verse number one. It says, the wicked flee when no man pursueth. How much in our types of churches do we see people flee all the time? And there's really nothing wrong. It's like, hey, what's plaguing you? Someone trying to murder you? No, I I bought this 80 inch TV and, you know, I just, I had to hook it up and so I couldn't come. And then, you know, this, this, and then, you know, it just, just the clear graphics. It just kind of got to me. And next thing you know, six months have gone by. (laughs) I can see the individual's face who said that to me right now. 80 inch TV, not even a human being got this individual to completely crash under pressure. How do you let a rectangular box with images get you away from God? (laughs) If you can't stand up to a TV that can't even read your mind, how are you going to understand? How are you going to stand up to people in the world? It isn't going to happen. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. The last time I heard about this individual, he was into some pretty wicked things. Now, obviously, he's, he's definitely saved. I, I know that for a fact. He, he's saved, but he's just out of control. Okay. Well, the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Okay, so the righteous say, and that's obviously believers, and and, and obviously the initial application here is the wicked people of the world, you know, they flee when nobody's pursuing. Okay, if you don't believe me, go get in the service industry, go into somebody's house who's wicked, like a sodomite. Okay, go into their house. They are triple masked, goggles, like everything you touch in their house is just like, you're not sick, are you? Oh, you, you know, I mean, it's just over the top. Like they're literally running for their lives. Just the mention of any type of virus of any sort, like, hey, Ebola might be coming. They're just like, whoa, they're just like freaking out. It doesn't even matter. Look, I'm not downplaying sickness. We are going to face pestilence as the day approaches. We have to understand that, okay? But I'm just telling you, the wicked people around, like these commies, they take this stuff to a whole nother level. Okay. And it's bizarre. And why is that? Because the wicked flee when no man pursueth. Wicked people really aren't bold. They just seem like they're bold. 
Look, when the CDC called, what was it, last year, the year before, and I wouldn't back down, what happened? Nothing. 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 Okay? You can't have your people outside without you. They must don. She says, you must don a facial covering the moment you step. I ain't donning nothing. Come make me, is what I said. Come make me. Come down here and make me. Where's she at? She said, I'm going to write this down here that you're untrainable. I don't care. I don't care. We're going to go out and preach the gospel. And the thing that really bothered me about that whole situation, and you guys, some of you know this, is that some people, or, or at least one guy, was chasing our soul winners down. Right? He flips out that they knock on their door without a mask and then proceeds to chase them down, violating all the rules and mandates. And I asked her about that and she's like, well, that's, you know, some people just get really upset and blah, blah, blah. No, you're wicked is what you are. Yeah. And we're not going to listen to those people. Right, right. We're going to do what we do. We're called to preach the gospel. That's what we're going to do. But here's the thing, man. It takes boldness. And, here, and look, you have to understand this too. You're not just going to be bold at church. You're not just going to be bold at soul winning and not be bold at your jobs and not be bold every other area in your marriages, every you know, relationship that you have. These things are connected. This needs to become who you are. Who you are. That is what we are learning today. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Go to Jude. Go to Jude. So just kind of, I don't know, show you an example of, of this here. So apologizing when not necessary can have a negative effect on your confidence. Let's talk about these apologicians. Okay, let's talk about people that are in the field, if you will, of apologetics. Okay, what, you know, are they really bold? Go listen to James White or Jeff Durbin or Ray Comfort or, I mean, really anybody out there who's got an apologetic YouTube channel, okay? And they say, oh, we're bold. You know, we've got hundreds of thousands of subscribers. We're, we're contending for the faith, okay? It, the question I have, is that true? I think you already know the answer. The answer is no. Like, like, why would you become part of a field or identify with a term called apologetics? What are you apologizing for? Right. Why are you apologizing for the truth? Here's the definition. Apologetics is the religious discipline of defending religious doctrines through systematic argumentation and discourse. Early Christian writers who defended their beliefs against critics and recommended their faith to outsiders were called Christian apologetics. Got that from a apologetics website. Why do I call them apologicians? What's a magician? Well, somebody who does magic tricks, right? Well, you have to be a magician to think you're going to contend for the faith and the truths of the Bible by using an apologetic type approach. Okay, and in that definition that I just read for you, apologetics is the systematic argumentation and discourse. Look, I preached that sermon. We had a guy just never come back. I preached a sermon called Apologicians. Uh, what was it, last year? And this dude never came back. Well, how dare you attack apologetics? Don't you know that the Christian bookstore's apologetic section is shrinking? Good. Amen. Good. That, amen. Christian bookstores are weak. They charge too much for King James Bibles, and everything else in there is pretty much garbage. You know, I mean, there's a reason why God's causing them to go out of business, okay? But here, here's something I want, I want to highlight for you. Look, listen to this. What are some of the synonyms for apologetics? Apology. So I just typed in the definition, okay? It gave me the similar definition that I just read for you, and then it says, click to learn synonyms. I click on that, and the very first one is apology. Okay, defense, excuse, uh, explanation, pretext, answer, apologia, argument, cleanup, cop out, uh, exoneration, extenuation, jive, plea, rationalization, rejoinder, reply, response, retort. Now you say, I've been involved in apologetics for a long time. Are you saying that that was all for now? Look, you can learn stuff from people like that, I'm sure. If that's your background, if you've read apologetics books, there are maybe some insights that you might glean that you can use, whatever. Okay, but those synonyms are kind of weird, right? <laughs> Apology, apologetics. Well, you're there in Jude. Look at verse number three. Let's see what the Bible says, right? Because, I mean, don't we, aren't we fundamental? Don't, don't we just want to do what the Bible says? Amen. 
Well, look at verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. So what are we commanded to do according to the Bible? Earnestly contend for the faith, not apologetically contend for the faith. Okay, so let me ask you a question. What are some synonyms for the word contend? Well, I had to look that up. <laughs> Didn't really have to, but I did just, just for fun. So it says this, the very first one, battle. Amen. Battle. Are, I mean, are we referred to as soldiers of Christ Amen. in the Bible? Right? Aren't we supposed to war a good warfare? Yep. I mean, that's what the Bible talks about. So battle, compete, face off, fight, race, rival, wrestle, grapple. <laughs> argue, wrangle, hold, claim, affirm, assert, command, truth. Aren't you glad you have a King James Bible? Amen. Right? We are called to earnestly, to urgently, to zealously, according to the truth, contend for the faith. And we talked about the faith on Wednesday, right? For that pure religion that we're called to live in. Not to stay saved, obviously, but to further the kingdom of God, to do the work of God, because that's what he wants. We exist. People always ask, why do we exist? Sometimes I'll have these liberal Christians. Ask, why, why do you think we exist? Well, I said, you know, the reason why the saved exist, I can tell you that, is to further the kingdom of God. And the reason why other people exist is so that hopefully they can hear the truth and feel after God and get saved. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's what this is about here to further truth. And here is the thing. You will not be able to do that if you are apologetic. Look, we're not attacking defending the faith. I mean, that's what we do here. Okay. That's why these seats are almost empty. Okay. Because we draw a line in the sand according to the word of God. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Go to Acts chapter number 13. Acts chapter number 13. So apologizing when not necessary can have a negative effect on your confidence. And so I, I think I made this statement when I preached that sermon about um, apologetics. I said that apologicians are great pretenders, not great contenders. Because they really don't contend for the faith, okay, when you listen to them. They, they attack the Bible. They attack truth. They're always, you know, into compromise. If you don't believe me, there is a YouTube channel called Cross Examined. I mean, th this, this guy, I forgot what his name is, but he's, he's pretty popular amongst the new evangelicals, right? And he goes in front of schools and crowds and tries to contend, if you will, for the faith. And I'm serious. Just click on a couple videos and you'll see him attack the Bible. You know, we don't need the Bible because people in the audience, they have questions that we can answer. You know, I wish I could just jump through the screen and just Leviticus 20, 13, you know, and just, you know, Acts 6, you know, just, just really give them the doctrine. But he almost never does that. He tries to sidestep and circumvent. And he tries to make like a, a connection with these people. Look, even these heathen um, people that are trying to contend for conservatism, they don't, a lot of them don't even do that. You know, you don't even, you don't see Carl, you know, Carl, what was that guy? Tucker Carlson, right? You don't see him apologizing. He's not even saved. You know, he just gets on TV and says what he has to say. And a lot of it's true. You know? <laughs> it is funny, right? But is he apologizing? No. If you see him or, and I hate this guy, Ben Shapiro, you know, does he apologize to the people that want to contend with him? No. So why are God's people doing that? Why are we apologizing for upsetting people? Should never do that when it's in regards to the truth. Okay. So let's take a look at some examples here. You're in Acts chapter 13. Look at verse 46. This is obviously Paul and Barnabas here. Look what it says. Verse 46. It says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, Paul had said that a number of times and always <laughs> ran back. But look, in order to not waste God's time, you have to be bold. Think about that. How does this apply to us? Well, you know how it applies to us. When we're out giving the gospel and someone's wasting your time, they're wasting God's time. Because almost every single time somebody is basically playing with you, right? They kind of give you a little nugget, like maybe they're interested and then they're listening. And then all of a sudden they challenge you and they keep that cycle up. You know what? You need to have enough boldness to be like, you know what? Have a nice day. 
I'm out. Okay, you're not believing what I'm saying here. I'm wasting my time, but we're also wasting God's time. What always happens a few doors later, somebody gets saved. Okay, and again, we are fighting a spiritual battle. There are people out there influenced by demonic activity that are trying to stop what we're doing. Okay, but in this situation, what does it say? Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. Do we have that capability? Yes, we do. If we don't live a life of constantly apologizing and saying we're sorry for things we should not be apologizing for. Uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. You'll see this all throughout the New Testament, just how bold the apostles were. Just bold, bold, confident. Okay. Look at verse number one. 2 Corinthians 10, look at verse one. It says, now I, Paul, beseech, or sorry, I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ who in presence am base among you, but being absent am bold toward you. So he would take the accusations that other people would throw at him and he would acknowledge them, but then he would demonstrate that it's not really going to hinder his mission. Does it hurt the heart? Yes. Words matter. Words mean things. And when people say things to us, you have to understand that it will hurt you. Okay. But it's what you do in that moment that determines how you are going to be. If Paul in this moment got the feedback from his letter, like, oh, they're saying that I'm weak. They're questioning my legitimacy as an apostle. They're throwing Stephen's past. They're throwing up all the wickedness that I did before I got saved. They're throwing up, you know, whatever. If he allowed that to just set on his shoulders and never just chucked it off, how many churches would he have started? How many people would he have gotten saved? Would he have had the boldness when he was giving his testimony to Herod, uh, you know, to, I mean, to Agrippa and to all these other people? Would he have had the boldness to acknowledge his past? Would he have had the boldness to, in Acts chapter 14, when he got beat, to be like, all right, where's the next town? Look, this guy would get beaten, stoned, kicked, physically assaulted, and he'd be like, all right, where's the next door we have to knock? <laughs> we, we have a thing called an alarm clock that goes off. That's not even human. That doesn't even know your thoughts. That doesn't even talk to you. That controls us sometimes, doesn't it? The thing goes off. We're just like, how many, so many times are on the bulletin? Oh yeah, I'm good. Bam. Right. And then we keep that up over and over and over and over again. The next thing you know, you're out. You can't even stand up to an alarm clock. That's not even human. How are you going to make it in life at all? How? You're not. You will have trouble. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Look at verse 1. So Paul tells the Thessalonians this. He says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much, don't miss this, contention. Look, did Paul ever apologize for preaching the truth? No. He, you know what? When you read his testimony and he describes his past and how he was consenting unto the death of Stephen, he didn't even apologize. Now, obviously, I'm sure we know for a fact he regretted that. Obviously. That goes without saying. But he didn't constantly, every time he brought it up, and I'm so sorry, oh, you know, and just beat himself down. Look, we have to learn to just let the past be the past. You can't change it. You can't go back. It's gone. It's done with. We need to keep moving forward and looking into eternity. And that's exactly what we see here. And what does that do for us as God's people? It allows us to have the boldness and confidence to actually go ahead and start contending for the faith. Look at verse 3. He says, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. You know what the Mormons do around here? And in a lot of places, the Jehovah Witnesses, and a lot of other groups that will knock on people's doors. So when the apartment manager comes out and challenges them, you know what they do? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. We will send you a gift card. This is a real thing. They, they have, they, this is what they do. They, they try to make an apology. Hey, what can we do to make this right? We, we didn't know. You know, we didn't see the sign. We'll, we'll mail you something. We'll send you a gift. We've had apartment managers and workers tell us that. 
that they will do that. And so, of course, when they see us, they see a dollar sign coming in. Oh, I'm going to get something out of this, right? There's a cash cow coming into my complex. What do we say? Get away from me. Get back inside. Here's what the law says. Call the cops. Who's ever heard me say that? <laughs> Just about everybody in here. All right? You want to call them? Call them. Okay? Look, we're not backing down. We're not backing down. Now, look, I'll tell you, there are, there are some times when, when apartment managers will come out that, that you do need to leave because we don't want to jeopardize a bunch of other doors. So you go to a place during the day, in the middle of the week, for example, and the guy comes out, look, you don't want to make a scene, or even on a Saturday, you don't want to make a big scene because we can always go back at night on Thursday. Okay, so you do have to have some smarts about this and think, you know, we don't want to be so overbold where we're like, you know, let's go. Because what if Boise PD shows up and it's the wrong person that shows up and actually causes a bunch of trouble, does trespass us. And now we can never go back. Right. So just understand there's balance with everything. Okay. Now I will tell people like, Hey, we're not breaking the law. I always try to start, you know, like, Hey, here's the definition of soliciting. Here's the Boise statute. I've got the code printed out right here. We are not breaking the law. We are totally legal. You know, once it gets past that, a lot of times it will be like, well, then call the cops. Do it. Because we want these people to understand that we're serious about what we're doing. Okay. But I'll usually do that and I'll kind of be gauging like, okay, if we got like four doors left, whatever. Yeah, call them, and then we'll even come back in a couple of years, you know, or, or next year, whatever. But, I mean, if it's like right off the bat, and it's a big complex, and you know there's people in there that can be saved, you got to be a little bit smart about that. You could just say, you know what, obviously, you don't want to follow the law, so whatever, and just leave and come back another time. That's okay. Because at the end game, right, I'm sorry, the, the end goal is to get people saved, right? If we get trespassed from every apartment around here, then what's the point? Okay, so just keep that in mind. Just, just something I thought of there. Uh, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter number eight. Ecclesiastes chapter number eight. And I'll read verse number four for you. It says this, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Again, this, this is the idea here. We need to be a people, and I think we are, that has our priorities straight. We want to please God rather than men. I think that's why you're here this morning. I think that's why you identify with this church is because that's our mission. How are we going to get people saved and actually edify and contend for the faith if we have the goal of pleasing men? We, you know, we're not interested in that. We are not interested in that at all. Paul wasn't interested in it. You know, Jesus wasn't interested in that. Did he ever apologize to the Pharisees? Did he ever apologize to the scribes? Did he ever apologize to the Sadducees? No. He told them the truth, and when they got hurt, he just took it even farther. And that's exactly what we have to do as God's people. So, here is what we do about this. Look at verse number 1. It says this, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 1. It says, Who is as the wise man? And who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? Now, don't miss this next part. A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. I want you to look after the question mark in that verse and tell me what it says. It says, a what? A man's what? Wisdom maketh. Okay, a man's wisdom maketh. It doesn't say a man's knowledge maketh. It doesn't say a man's ability to get along with other people maketh. It doesn't say that a man who can get along and say sorry over every single thing that he does maketh his face to shine. It's wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is knowledge that is applied. Okay, it's different than knowledge. You need that knowledge, and then you have to actually use that knowledge. Okay, we've talked about this in great detail in the past. Um, let's see, go to Exodus chapter number 34. Exodus chapter number 34. So we can see that it's wisdom that makes our face to shine. That's what gives us boldness. You say, you know, I, I've seen this before. We're, 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 we get new Christians in, they start learning the Bible, and then like six months later, you know, seven months later of reading and just coming to church and just applying the things that they've learned here, like they're like a different person. You know, their, their countenance completely changes. Like, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll think about like the first time I met a person and then like how they are now. And it's like, wow, this is really amazing. That is this verse right here. 
That is the idea behind meeting three times a week. That's the idea of assembling ourselves together and centering this service around the Word of God. It's to make us bold by giving us wisdom, right? I try to give you some knowledge and some things for you to do, for us, for me to do, for us to do and apply in our lives throughout the week. When we do those things, you don't get to see it, but other people will see it around you. You increase your confidence. You increase your boldness, which only increases results, okay? So I want to say this again, never apologize for doing or offending people. Okay, do, you know, never apologize for doing stuff according to the Word of God. Does that make sense? Don't ever apologize for that. Don't apologize for doing soul winning. Don't apologize for doing your Bible reading. Don't apologize for speaking the truth, for standing up to people. I don't care how long you've known them. If it comes from this book and we are supposed to do it, we are supposed to believe it, we're supposed to receive it, don't make the apology, okay? I'll tell you this story here. I was in a meeting one time and uh, there's this admiral. He used to come in late all the time. These, these guys, it's something that they do. I remember one time he was really late, you know, and I was kind of thinking, I don't know. I just had this thought, like, I wonder what he's going to say. You know, like, it's like, like, he's really late, right? We've got a lot of stuff to do. This is when I was working for the government. You know what he does? He comes in. He's like, hey, thanks for you guys' patience. And he sits down and people are like, oh, no problem, sir. Hey, no problem. Oh, no problem. I've seen people of his caliber come in late and not say that and get yelled at, chewed. Like they come in saying, hey, I'm so sorry. You know, they start apologizing and it's like all of a sudden people get like this extra boldness, right? Like, like the, the bosses and the other big wigs would get like this extra boldness, like almost like he's coming in limping, like weak. And they're like, oh, well, they turn into wolves all of a sudden. They're just going to pounce, you know? This guy, he, this guy, he comes in and he's like, hey, thanks for you guys' patience. You know, I really appreciate it. And people are just like, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. And, and think about that for a second. <laughs> Try it out sometime. <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't abuse this stuff. I'm just simply saying it works. Okay? And it's not wrong. I realize this guy's not wrong. You know? He didn't have to explain himself. I mean, this is a very powerful individual. Very powerful individual. You know? He knew he was late. knew he messed up. Did he really wrong anybody, though? No, it's just not ideal. You know, we have like, we had, used to have like five meetings a day. You, know, you could say whatever you, you could miss one. And it's like the next one's the same thing as people yelling and, you know, tipping tables and screaming. It's, it's all the same temper tantrum all five times. It's the same thing. This guy just said, Hey, thanks for your patience. Thanks for waiting. You know, a lot of times, um, you call tech support for the internet. You know what some of these companies will say? They're not, they're not, they don't apologize. They're just like, Oh, Hey, yeah. You know, we really appreciate your patience while we work this issue out here. Who's ever had somebody say that? Think about a time someone has pulled that on you for one of these companies, right? It, it, what, is it, what does it cause you to feel? You're like, all right, all right, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I understand. I don't know, this is something I learned while studying this. It's, it's interesting, right? So I'm just simply saying this, reserve some boldness for yourself while simultaneously taking ownership, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. Just get out of the habit of just, you know, saying you're sorry for every single little thing that you do, okay? I'm not talking like if I bump and step on somebody's toes, like physically, I'd be like, oh, whoop, whoops, sorry. I'm not going to be like, hey, thanks for, you know, <laughs> your patience while your toe heals, right? Obviously, there's little things like that. That's not what we're talking about. You know what we're talking about. We're talking about people that are just overly apologetic, okay? They're weak. And if we go down that road, we're weak. And we don't want to be weak like that. We want to be humble. We want to be a people of balance, Okay. So you're there in Exodus 34, look at verse 29. The meekest man during this time on the earth was who? It was Moses, right? Look at what it says in verse 29. And it came to pass when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand. When he came down from the Mount that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. Now look, <laughs> this preaches all by itself. He goes up to the mount. He gets the commandments, which are what? Well, they're things that we need to do. The commandments themselves, when you read them, okay, well, that's knowledge. That's what I got to do. When you apply and you actually live by those things, it gives you that boldness that Solomon told us, right? Through wisdom, a man's face begins to shine, and that's how we get boldness. So this is what happens, right? He doesn't even realize it. He has no idea that his face is shining. But look what it says in verse 30. 
And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh unto him. This is something that will happen and probably is happening right now to you. Okay, Your family members that see the boldness that you have, they are afraid. They are fearful. And they exercise, they show that fear in different ways. Some of them just won't want to talk to you. Others, they're going to bring their friends in and they're going to try to overpower you. They're going to do something to you. They're going to say something. They're going to try to get you to back down. Why? It's because they are afraid. When you see who's ever, everybody in here has been around somebody who's extremely bold at what they're doing, right? It kind of, it kind of makes you feel a certain way, right? When you go to a job site and you, you know, you're working on something and somebody comes along and they've got a lot of experience doing what you're doing. Right? There's a little bit of an intimidation factor when they're watching you. Okay? It works across the board. This is why people lash out at us when we go to apartment buildings or we go to neighborhoods. And it's not every single door. I don't want to scare you from soul hunting, but it does happen. The reason why they lash out and, and something that will help you to understand is that they are afraid. Okay? They can see the boldness that we have. It takes boldness to go knock on someone's door. <laughs> you know, one, one of the things that I've learned about this community here in the Treasure Valley is that people are like homebodies, you know, they don't like to go out and, I don't know, meet new people or, or, or do things. You know, it's kind of a funny thing. We were talking about this last night. You know, it's like everything, even before the whole coronavirus, you know, hit, it's like things just close early here, you know, and it's weird. Because like where we're from, like in Washington, everything is open late. You know, in California, everything was open late, you know, because of the busy lifestyle. There's a lot going on down there. And it's like, man, it's midnight. I've been doing all this crazy stuff here. You know, I can go to In-N-Out Burger. You get hungry here at midnight, you better hope you have some food at home. <laughs> you get hungry here at nine o'clock at night, you better hope you have some food at home or know somebody. Because <laughs> <Right? laughs> you're not going to Burger King right down the street here. And again, you probably shouldn't go there anyways because their chicken nuggets suck. But <laughs> you get the point, okay? Your boldness, your confidence is tied to how off balance you are in regards to apologizing. It's a fact. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. So again, the first thing I just wanted to, 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 to teach this morning was apologizing when not necessary can have negative effects on your confidence. So saying sorry for bothering you sorry all the time when you're not sorry okay what does that do i think it subconsciously affects the way that we operate so let's look at verse number eight again because i want to bring something up at the end of the verse here that's going to help us out a lot so he says this for though i made you sorry with the letter i do not repent though i did repent for i perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry Though it were but for a season. You see that there? For a season. I think it can really help us to understand what Paul's trying to communicate to us here. You know, especially when it comes to disciplining kids or, you know, standing up to that family member, that friend, that coworker, whoever it may be, you need to understand that the pain that we cause through preaching the truth really is only for a season. It's only for a season. And here's the other thing. It produces results. It does. It produces results. Either way you slice it, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, the Bible says. So when you preach it, when you tell people it, when you stand up for it, you get results. You may not get the results that you like. You may not get the results that your old man wants, but you will get results. Go to Matthew chapter number 10, okay? You're either going to get a positive outcome immediately, or it's going to go down the road as a testimony into eternity, okay? Which either way you slice it is what? It's a positive outcome. The word of God always comes back full. It never returns void, ever. That is what the Bible teaches. And Paul's saying, you know, yeah, I made you sorry, though it were for a season. And why is that? Because he got a positive outcome in that situation. They read the letter. They went through their little grieving process, if you will, and they got things right. They got a lot of things right. They didn't get everything right, but they got a lot of things right. Okay. And that is exactly why we do church the way that we do it. But I want to show you something here. Matthew 10, verse 16. 
Look at what Jesus does. So this is this passage here where Jesus is getting the disciples and he's sending them out two by two. Okay. And he tells them, you know, don't take script, don't take your purse, don't take your, you know, any supplies. You're basically just going to go out. It was a miracle. Okay. You know, it was a miracle situation, but there's a lot of application in it for us today because he makes a statement. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Think about that. That was true back then. And that is certainly true today. Okay. That is certainly true today. You, we are as sheep among wolves and there's a certain recipe. There's a certain way that we need to conduct ourselves in order to survive. Look what he says next. Be ye therefore. So for that reason, he says, be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Hmm. What does that mean? Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Well, first of all, I've mentioned this several times. Okay. We no longer live in physical Israel. Okay. We live right here in the United States of America. We have a law. Okay. There are things you cannot do to people. You cannot do what Nehemiah did to people, which was wrong even back then. Okay. I'll admit it you know, and pluck people's beards out because they're not obeying the truth and just, you know, doing the Jehu, right? Just going forth and just conquering. I mean, imagine the satisfaction that would bring though, man. If you could just be Jehu and just go to all the people that just hate God and just be like, yes, boom, man, you're just taking them out left and right. Everybody in here secretly wants to do that, but we can't. Okay. We can't, we have to be harmless as doves. We are not about physical confrontation though. I'm not against self defense. Okay. The recipe is what it's wisdom. It's combining wisdom because wisdom produces boldness and boldness produces results. Okay. We can turn the world upside down without literally lifting up a finger to somebody. Think about that for a second. So look at verse 17, but beware of men for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Verse 18, and you shall be brought before governors and Kings for my sake. Now don't miss this for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. So what does this point back to results standing up for the truth gets results. They may have to go as a testimony like they are here, but they get results. They get recorded into heaven. And that is the idea. That is the goal. Ecclesiastes chapter number eight, verse one says what a man's wisdom maketh his face to shine and the boldness of his face shall be changed. That there is what we are after in, you know, in this church, we need that because we are literally amongst wolves. It was true back then. And it is true today. The Bible says that knowledge puffeth up. That's what Paul told people. That's what Paul told the Corinthians. Hey, knowledge puffeth up. This is why I'm so hard on fanboys. And when they come in here, we try to get them to be fanatics of God as fast as possible, because if not, we're going to lose them. And we've lost all of them. We have a 100% success rate of observing fanboys fall out. If you don't take that knowledge and turn it into wisdom, you never get boldness. You get puffed up and that helium balloon that comes up into your dome inside of your head just carries you right out the door and you never come back. You start blowing around about every wind of doctrine, don't you? Isn't that what happens? That's exactly what happens. Knowledge puffeth up, but wisdom maketh bold. Okay. Look at verse 19. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak. For it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. Now, did the apostles get delivered up like during this time? No. They had some issues, but they all came back and they talked about the great things and the miracles that they were able to do, right? So why word it this way? Why does Jesus say this? But when they deliver you up? Well, because a lot of them probably did get delivered up later on in life. And because he knew that we would be reading this later on, and this totally applies to us. There's coming a day, there's coming a time period where we will be the enemy. I mean, we're the enemy now, but I'm talking like the legal enemy where it will be open season on the Christian and only the bold will survive. Look at verse 20 for it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father, which speaketh in you. So here's the deal. If we're just apologizing for the truth, then it's not the spirit speaking in us. Right. 
This is why apologicians, apologetic people, they're not really contending for the faith. They're just making matters worse. That's all that they're doing. And they're weak, all of them. Go look them up if you don't believe me. Go, to back, uh, go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We are getting close to being done. So the application here is very simple. It's to rejoice when you make someone sorry over the truth. You say, why? Why be happy about that? Because you make your heavenly father happy. That's why. And because it's only going to be for a season and because it's going to get you results and it's going to increase your confidence in your boldness. Okay. And start with the objects. Okay. Stand up to the TV, stand up to the alarm clock, stand up to the KitchenAid mixer, whatever it is. All right. Stand up to the cheeseburger, which I'm not going to do here in a little while. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to devour that guy. But anyways, <laughs> big buns calling. All right. But anyways, whatever. Look at verse nine. Second Corinthians seven. Look at verse number nine. Paul says this. Now I rejoice. Not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Right? So here, you got to have the right attitude, right? We're not out just to get people mad just so we can laugh. Because the old man does think it's pretty funny. Okay? When I was a kid, man, I made it a mission to get my parents upset just to laugh. You know? I watch Looney Tunes and see, you know, one of them cartoon characters put a thumbtack down under someone's seat and watch how they act. I did that to my dad. And that's why I'm in the situation I'm in now with him. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just simply saying not that ye were made sorry. Okay. But what does Paul say? That ye sorrow to repentance. What is repentance? Just a change. He's like, hey, you guys were all puffed up. You were all messed up. He's like, but my letter caused repentance. We're not talking about salvation here. We're not talking about going to heaven and hell. He's saying, hey, you simply changed. You accepted the truth, and now you're doing better. That's all he's saying. Verse 10, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Okay, so he compares these two concepts here. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Okay, look, when you're out and you're soul winning and you're giving them the two-edged sword, right? This word, the word of God, you're giving people the Bible. It does cause them some sorrow. When you tell them what Jesus did on the cross and how he is the satisfaction, he is the propitiation for their sins, and you say there's nothing left to do but to believe. That's all you have to do. That, that's all you can do is believe. You literally cannot repent of your sins. You can't turn from them for your salvation because he's already picked up the tab. It's too late. The only thing left that you can do is believe. And here's what he did for you. And you talk about what he did, how he lived this life, and how he was beaten in the torture and in, in, in the cross, and then how he overcame that. You know what? That does produce a godly sorrow in a lot of people. And they're like, wow, I didn't know he did all of that. I didn't, you know... I didn't know he went to hell for three days, three nights. That's crazy. That does produce a change of mind in people. And that's what Paul's saying. But this goes in every area of life. Okay. Preaching sermons in a lot of people's lives will cause a godly sorrow. I'm like, wow, you know, that's me. You're stepping on my toes. That hurts. Right. I'm going to change. I'm going to repent. And it will produce salvation on that type of level. Okay. Not every time you see the word salvation in the Bible is talking about heaven and hell. A lot of times, you know, it's talking about saving a relationship or just saving you physically or just saving us from unnecessary trials and tribulation. You know, each day has enough evil of itself. We don't need to make it worse. Okay. Which is why we're going to talk about something here in a second. Look at verse 11. For behold, the selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. So again, because Paul was bold, because Paul was wise, because he didn't back down to his emotions, he got these results here. Look, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement, or vehement, vehement desire. Ye, what zeal. Yea, what revenge in all things. Ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. He got the results. But if he had been an apologetic type person and been going back and forth, well, I'm, I, you, you, this is wrong, you know, and I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, they wouldn't have changed. They would have sniffed that out and been like, that's <laughs> yeah, all good. It's not that big of a deal, right? 
but he didn't do that. He didn't back down. And that's what we need to be like. That's what we need to understand. And so we're getting close to being done, but I want to bring a couple of things up. And, you know, this is about our church here, okay? So talking about when not to apologize. Because if you've probably heard this before, every once in a while, someone in here will lose a friend. Okay? Because of me. <laughs> it's usually because of me, or because you go here, and because of me. And it doesn't happen all the time. It doesn't happen every week. It doesn't happen every day. It doesn't ha happen every month. And I'm saying this sarcastically because it is just about every week. <laughs> okay? It is just about every week. But look, we're not making any apologies for the way this church is ran. I'm not making any apologies at all. I am not sorry at all. Okay? Look, we have this church set up a certain way because I have a vision Sunday mornings and I'm not changing this and if you don't like it you can get out Sunday mornings we take life's issues and we intersect them with the Bible you don't like it there's the door get out get out I'm not changing I'm not sorry because I've seen it change people's lives. Sunday nights is our verse by verse or book by book, however you want to describe it, however we do it. Study, okay? It's a little bit deeper. It, it can be intense. Everyone's welcome. It is what it is. I make no apologies for that. Because every once in a while, I'll get a little email. Hey, you know, I'm looking for a church that's got some Bible study. that has got some real good, you know, teaching and truth. You know, and they come Sunday morning and, oh, you know, I want it verse by verse. They, they never give us a chance. But you know what? I'm not apologizing. What's Wednesdays? Wild Wednesdays around here. What's that for? Okay. Well, by the time Wednesday rolls around, everybody in here is upset about something in the world. So I try to take a doctrine. I try to take something, you know, that we can contend with. And Wednesdays is the Wild West, man. It's, it's to scrap against. It's to contend for the faith. Okay, that's why, that is, that is how I have designed our services. I'm not apologizing for it at all. Because there's a small group of people that have let me know they don't like that. They don't like that wall back there with those bottom lines on it. I don't care. You worry about you, I'll worry about us. How's that sound, pal? Don't tell me what to do. I've been trained for the ministry. I know what I'm doing. Now understand what I'm trying to tell you. I've been trained. I'm not, I wasn't trained to be a copycat. Every church is a little bit different. That's okay. I'm not trying to be different for the sake of being different. I have different experiences. I have a different past. I have a different way of communicating. I've taken different classes. We live in a different state. We live in a different environment. We have different people. We have a different style building. Everything is different. So we're, to, to copy someone else just isn't going to work. And someone recently kind of, you know, God bless them, you know, just kind of was broken hearted over, not, not, not offended necessarily, but just broken hearted over that. Honestly, brokenhearted. I know leadership. I'm not the best at it by any means, but I know how to take people and get something done. So you just have to, you just have to understand that. You just have to realize that. Okay? We, we've been given a certain amount of resources, and that's what we have to work with. And it is what it is. But here's the thing. The more that we grow, the more that we're going to grow numerically. You understand that? If you guys aren't growing, then I'm failing. I'm doing something wrong. But you are growing. And let me tell you a way that we're growing, okay? Who's got a bulletin from last month? Yeah, yeah you know, we got some bulletins around here probably from last month. You know, you know that we just got this space back here. Our bills went up. You know, we did not raise enough money to pay our bills. But they're still gonna get paid because God blessed me with a better job which was my old job, but that's a sermon on its own. It's going to be called the midlife crisis. But here's the thing. It's not because of disobedience. It's because of obedience. It's because people are getting things right 
in their family, and they're trying to live the way that God wants them to live. You understand what I'm saying? So that's a good thing. You know, look at that. Don't be discouraged. It's a rejoicing thing. God always will take care of our needs. You know, sometimes you'll go to that mailbox out there and it's like, oh, oh, there it is. There's the difference right there. Or we'll click online. Oh, there's the difference right there. And it always works out. But again, I'm not making any apologies for that. We're not going to apologize to anyone for preaching the truth, for standing up against the alphabet community, because those people would kill every human being in this building if they could. When you lose friends, you lose, you know, family members, I'm not apologizing and you shouldn't either. Another thing, I'm not going to apologize to visitors because something bothered them. Okay. Someone yesterday, someone last night and, you know, they emailed and said, you know, basically tried to, to inject some Mennonite doctrine on me. <laughs> and I was like, whatever, just responded back with a quick Bible verse. Here you go. You know, and just that was the end of it. What would have happened if I'd have been like, well, here's what we believe on that issue, but I really want you to come down here and I'm, I'm so sorry. You know, do you think God's going to bless that? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. What does God bless? Boldness. Boldness. He's looking for people that can war a good warfare. People that can stand up for the truth. That's what he's looking for. That's what he's after. Okay. Um, so we're almost done here. I'm just going to wrap this up right now because I think I've taken enough of your time. So again, everything boils down to this. What does an apology require of me? Can you answer that? An apology requires a transgression. An apology requires a wrong. If you tell someone the truth from the word of God, have you wronged them? No. The truth has wronged them, not you personally. So if you can understand that and someone's coming at you and someone's like, hey, why are you going to that cult? First of all, this isn't a cult because that door stays open. Cults shut the door. Okay? Cults don't let you leave. We let you leave. You're free to come and go as you please. The idea here, and I think you understand the answer, we don't apologize. What does an apology require of me? It requires, first of all, to be present a wrong, a transgression, something that you did wrong to someone else. And it, it, what does it do? It incurs a debt. You now owe that and you need to pay that. Simple as that. When you can understand that, you can start to function better. You know, you'll find yourself in these situations like, man, am I supposed to apologize? And you think about it, what does an apology require of me? Well, it requires a wrong. It requires a debt, something that you have to pay. It requires a bill that needs to be paid. Okay. And if it doesn't, because it comes from this book here, then guess what? You don't owe that to anybody and you shouldn't pay it. And you should not pay it. So I guess the challenge for this week, for me especially, is I'm going to stop saying sorry for bothering you. Because after going through this and really thinking about this and studying this, I'm not sorry that I knocked on your door. I'm not sorry that I stepped on anyone's toes. I'm not sorry that I spoke the truth. I'm not sorry that we run this church the way that we do. And really, if you go and visit other new IFB churches and talk to the other pastors, they have no problems with anything here because it's very, very, very similar. You know, it's very similar. I mean, the only real difference, just really the way the building's laid out, you know, the years we've been in service, you know, they don't have the Shield of Faith Baptist, you know, Bible book list, you know. They have a different banner. That's really it. But every so often there's a minority of, of, of pupils outside of these churches that say, well, that's not quite what he said. I have different lenses. You know, I might interpret a verse just a little bit differently. We all, we're all like that. You get all of those pastors in a room and we're going to, you know, hash it out on different, you know, verses. But all the doctrine's the same. Does that make sense? You might just have little differences here and there. It's the outside people. There's always going to be these template cutters, these template pushers. And, I'm, and it's hard not to get sick of them. 
<laughs> because they're annoying and vexing. And I've just realized that the solution is to not apologize to them. So that's what I'm going to do. And my challenge to you is to identify some areas in your life where you're apologizing when you shouldn't be and make those changes. And I'm telling you, you're going to see your wisdom increase. You're going to see that boldness increase. And you'll be able to notice it in other people, which is a tool that we need. We need to discern other people. We need to, to know how other people are doing in the faith so that we can help them out. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay. What does an apology require of me? A wrong, which incurs a debt that needs to be paid. And that, you know, anytime you're preaching something or teaching something from this book, guess what? You don't owe anyone anything but more of that truth <laughs> and more of that. And remember, that pain that they feel is only for a season and it's going to produce results. It's painful. Paul even said it, right? Said, I don't repent, though I did repent. Okay? You, you, we are people. We have emotions. These emotions arise in us. And you just have to realize you got to fight that old man. You've got to fight that self. You have to fight through these. And I think I've given you the tools this morning to actually do that in this subject. So we're done right now. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, for, again, this great truth in your word. I just pray, Lord, that you would help us to find balance with the subject of apologies and uh, help us to, to increase our wisdom that we can have that boldness, Lord, uh, that we need so that you can use us better. And we thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.